Good morning, I'm Don Patton. Together with Dennis Carroll, we talk to you about truth of God's Word on Sunday mornings. Welcome to What is True. We're talking this morning, uh, and by the way, we do have these lessons available on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, we'd invite you to worship with us at Little Rock Church of Christ. I-430 and Rodney Parham, and then Sunday uh, evening at 5 o'clock. We're talking to you this morning about Rahab, who is a very interesting character from the Old Testament. She was a resident of Jericho, one of the first, well, the first city the Israelites encountered when they began their conquest of Israel. The New Testament mentions uh, a number of uh, women, but very few, uh, doesn't mention Esther uh, or Deborah or Hannah, who were true heroines of faith, but uh, Rahab is mentioned three times in the New Testament. She is certainly in that area of uh, a heroine of faith. She's one of three women mentioned in the lineage of Christ. Uh, she was one who was uh, uh, demonstrating a great deal of integrity, not a Jew. She was, of course, from the area of Palestine. She was from a very immoral society and demonstrated a noble heart even in that context. God took notice of that and rewarded that noble heart with opportunities to know the truth and to follow the Word of God. Uh, in Joshua 6, verse 22, we read, Rahab the harlot and her father's household and all she had, Joshua spared. Uh, he did that because she obeyed and uh, she responded with faith that produced her obedience. She lived in the midst of Israel uh, and served God faithfully as a result of her conduct because she hid the messengers whom Joshua had sent to spy out Jericho. We see the lineage of Christ mentioned in Matthew chapter 1, uh, the list of those who went from Adam all the way to Christ. But here at uh, Matthew 1, verse 5, we read of Salmon, who was the father of Boaz by Rahab. Who was Salmon? Well, we're not sure. We don't know the names of the spies, but the romantic in me leads me to think maybe this was the spy, one of the spies that was there and was impressed with Rahab and her courage and her faith and then eventually became his wife. They produced Boaz, who you recall is the, the father, uh, or the, the wife, uh, married Ruth and produced uh, Obed as a result, and then Jesse, and then David, the king. This is the lineage, Solomon, Boaz, Obed, Jesse, and David. Uh, it looks like this when we diagram it. Boaz and Ruth, then Obed and Jesse and David. David was the great grandson of Rahab the harlot, the resident of Jericho who hid the spies. We see God's attitude reflected when she's included in the list of the great men of faith, the hall of fame of faith, as it's sometimes referred to from Hebrews chapter 11 introduced by verse 1, the faith, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, followed by the list of those who demonstrate faith. We get down to verse 32 and we read of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, David, great men of faith included in this hall of fame, portraits on the wall, if you please, of great faith are two women. Sarah is there. She was, of course, the wife of the father of the faithful Abraham. 
We're told in verse 11 that she received ability to conceive since she considered him faithful who had promised, even at a great age. She had difficulty with her faith, but then did respond in faith and was blessed as a result. Famous person of faith in the Old Testament. Well, Rahab's portrait would be a little tarnished from her background, but God cleaned it completely and put it right up there on the wall beside Sarah, which demonstrates God's faithfulness to forgive when people respond in faith. Uh, I notice that this is portrayed uh, as uh, Rahab having the red hair. Uh, we, of course, don't know that. We do know that David had red hair from the descriptions that we find in the Old Testament. Maybe this is where he got it. That's, of course, speculation. But we know, according to Hebrews 11, verse 31, by faith, Rahab the harlot did not perish along with those who were disobedient after she welcomed the spies in peace. The pivotal factor is obedience, disobedience. Those disobedient perished. She was obedient because of her faith. And where and how did she come to have this faith? She wasn't among the Jews. The Jews, of course, failed in their faith. Forty years wandering in the wilderness was the consequence because of their unbelief. They didn't enter. But now then, in contrast to the Jews who had all the advantages of seeing the deliverance from Egypt, the Red Sea parting, the plagues, uh, still believed but then failed in their faith, whereas Rahab is the example of one who was faithful. Notice in Joshua 2 and verse 9, I know that the Lord has given you the land. How did she know that? Maybe she's talking here to Solomon, her future husband. The terror of you has fallen on us, that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea. Now, this was an event that occurred 40 years earlier, but she knew about it. She had heard, and then the more recent events, what you did to the two kings of the Amorites, to Shion and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. When she saw God's power demonstrated in the benefit of these individuals, she was moved to faith. When we heard it, our hearts melted. No courage remained in any man any longer for you. For the Lord your God, he is God. Now, maybe the rest of the people in Jericho didn't uh, reach this conclusion. She did. The Lord your God, he is God in heaven above, on the earth beneath. That integrity looking at the evidence led her to that conclusion. Uh, back in Exodus chapter 9, we read of the events she's describing. The plagues were sent on Egypt so that you may know that there's no one like me in all the earth. Israel saw that, but it wasn't just for Israel. In order to show my power, in order to proclaim my name throughout all the earth, it was not just for Pharaoh, not just for the Israelites, but it was for the rest of the earth, and some in the rest of the earth paid attention. And Ruth was one of those over 700 miles away, but nevertheless heard of and knew of that power and reached the appropriate conclusion. When Israel saw the great power which the Lord had used against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and they believed in the Lord and his servant Moses. It wasn't because they prayed through. It wasn't because they had the experience of grace that God chose and zapped them uh, unconditionally. They believed when they saw the evidence and were honest enough to acknowledge it, that faith faded, and ultimately they paid the price of perishing in the wilderness. Romans chapter 9 refers to that event. We're told the scripture says to Pharaoh, and it's interesting to notice the way 
Paul describes this. God actually said this to Pharaoh, but he says, the scripture says to Pharaoh. Well, what's the difference? Not a thing. That which was said by God is called scripture. Uh, scripture is called that which is said by God. The scripture says, God said it's absolutely immaterial. That shows Paul's attitude toward inspiration. For this very purpose I've raised you up that I may demonstrate my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. It was proclaimed in all the earth and heard by uh, Rahab and she responded in faith as was appropriate. This is exactly the process of faith for Christians. We look at the evidence. We see eyewitness testimony of the signs that Jesus did. The very term itself is an indication of a, a wonder that has significance. It signifies the fact that Jesus was the Son of God. He walked on the water, stilled the storm, raised the dead. These signs were performed in the presence of the disciples and many others which are not written, he says, but these have been written so that you might believe, not because of a feeling you get or just crunching up your forehead and willing it so. Looking at the evidence and evaluating it honestly like Rahab did and being persuaded by the evidence that God is. Romans chapter 1, Paul talked about that kind of evidence and the appropriate conclusion when he said, Since the creation of the world, the invisible attributes of his eternal power, his divine nature, are clearly seen. How do you see them? Being understood through what has been made, so that they're without excuse. The word excuse there is translated defense or answer. They don't have a defense. They don't have an answer. They are without excuse because of the evidence that we see in the world around us. That's the kind of evidence that Rahab saw. We can look today at all kinds of evidence. For example, the archaeological evidence uh, regarding Jericho uh, is obvious. You have difficulty going there today because of some of the political problems, but we see here uh, evidence of the excavations on the tell of Jericho, the ancient city, the mound, and uh, lots of indications that this was the ancient city. Bryant Wood did some very significant work there uh, in the year 2000 to 2002, professor of Near Eastern Studies, University of Toronto. And he exposed the retrievement wall that surrounded the, the tell on which the city was built. Uh, and then the fallen brick from the upper wall piled at the base of the encampment. That brick fell outward and formed a ramp around the city, which he helped expose. I had the privilege of being a part of some of that work and could see here the remnants of the fallen wall in Jericho. We have some of those bricks along with some of the other evidence in our museum here in Little Rock. This is the diagram that Bryant produced. We see the upper wall where there had been houses and then the mud brick wall that supported them and then the retaining wall with the brick fallen outward all the way around it so that as the text says, the Israelites could go straight up ahead as they surrounded the city all the way around, they went straight up into the city. Uh, the walls having fallen by the power of God. Not because they marched them down, but because when they marched, God pulled them down. God shook them down. <clears throat> Lots of evidence is seen here. Uh, Kathleen Kenyon was a famous skeptic who said it couldn't be Joshua's Jericho because there's no separate pottery. And when she dug, she dug in the poor part of the city and didn't find it. Uh, Bryant Wood found all kinds of it there and uh, actually had been found by Garstang earlier. He found a continuous unbroken series of Egyptian scarabs which were dated. Now that's really unusual in archaeology to find dates, but here is a series of scarabs that were found 
That's the little stamps that were used to impress the clay to certify a document. Beginning from the 18th century right down to the time of the conquest, and then it ended. Wow, that's really powerful evidence. But the, the most exciting evidence, in my mind, is the small portion of the north wall that was still standing, a very small section with that brick wall up on top where houses were. And this is a diagram by Garstang, who worked there in the early 30s. Uh, there in that small section is a re remaining portion of that mud brick wall. And here's a picture that he took in the early 30s of what remained almost 3,000 years later, uh, with the window indicating here was a place of residence was restored to look something like this. And recall in Joshua chapter two that her house was on the city wall. And we can see that residence there, um, continuing asking them to deal kindly with my father's house, same word, house was on the city wall, deal kindly with my father's house. And when the walls came tumbling down, that was what was remaining. And there is that small portion that he saw and photographed in the early 30s uh, that we see in the photograph here. I think I know who lived there. Uh, this is exactly, uh, fit, it certainly does fit the text just exactly as we read it in Scripture. We see Rahab as an example of obedience. As uh, Hebrews says, she was distinguished by her obedience as opposed to the disobedience of others. James, too, uh, tells us that Rahab was justified by works. Uh, by faith, Hebrews 11 told us that the harlot, Rahab the harlot did not perish with those who were disobedient. She was not disobedient. She welcomed the spies in peace. But James, the brother of the Lord, says she was justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way. Now, this is an example of our salvation, according to James. Uh, and one of the reasons she was blessed was because she obeyed and justified by works in the sense that God blessed her as a result of her demonstration of faith. Not that she earned anything by her works, but she had works to perform. God set conditions. James makes the point very dramatically when in verse 26 he says, just as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. Uh, I think we understand spirit, body, you separate the two, you have death. You separate faith from works, you have death. That is a dead faith and you don't depend on that for salvation. Yet a lot of preachers today are preaching salvation by faith only and they're not preaching the truth. Galatians 5, we read, for in Christ neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through law. This is the kind of faith that does save. As James tells us, you see that faith was working with his works. As a result of the works, faith was perfected. Rahab perfected her faith when she obeyed and was blessed and therefore was exalted to that hall of fame in Hebrews chapter 11 and then used by James as an example of our salvation. It shows very clearly that contrary to those who teach unconditional election, salvation was conditional. Back in Joshua chapter 2, the men said to her, our life for yours if you do not tell this business of ours. It shall come about when the Lord gives us the land, we will deal kindly. But this was conditioned. It was an if you do not tell and then continuing unless when we come into the land, 
you tie this cord of scarlet thread in the window through which you let us down and gather yourself into the house, your father and your mother, your brothers, all, they had to be in the house. She had to tie the cord. Uh, all of that had to be done. And unless she did that, she would not be spared. She could sit back and say, well, I just, I, I believe. But if she didn't get in the house, then she would perish. Uh, we need to understand that that's being given by James as an example of our salvation. Continuing verse 20 in Joshua 2, If you tell this business of ours, we will be free from the oath which you made us swear. We see all kinds of conditions set forth, and she says, I agree to these conditions. And she sent them on their way and tied the rope. She met the conditions. She did what she was supposed to do. Didn't earn anything, but was blessed by God when she demonstrated her faith. You remember in John 8, Jesus said faith was a condition. People who speak of unconditional salvation ignore that unless you believe that I'm he, you'll die in your sins, but that's not the only condition. James makes that very clear when he says, you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way, verse 25, comparing with Rahab, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works? Now, how are we saved by faith <laughs> when that faith is perfected? when in the same way with right now, maybe you think it's different. James, the brother of Jesus, says it's in the same way that Rahab the harlot was justified. We notice the conditions. If you do not tell, unless expresses a clear condition, you tie this cord, you let us down, you gather all into your father's household, you need today to be in the household of God in order to be saved. Meet the conditions in the same way, he says. Except is a word that expresses that condition. John 8, verse 24, except you believe, except you repent, Luke 13, 3, except you're born again, John 3, verse 3, you'll not see the kingdom. Thayer defines the word except as a conditional particle. This is the original word, the Holy Spirit inspired in the Greek, clearly indicating conditional salvation, or you'll die in your sins, you'll perish, you'll not see the kingdom. It's based on conditions, as was the case with Rahab, in the same way, James says, Rahab the harlot, her father's household, all she had, Joshua spared, for she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Those who teach that it is unconditional are not teaching the truth. Those who teach salvation by faith only are teaching a dead faith. Uh, Second Peter chapter 2 speaks of false teachers introducing heresies that don't matter. Uh, destructive heresies, bringing swift destruction on themselves. This is a matter of serious consequence. When we look at the scarlet cord of this story, I think we see some obvious symbolism, a symbol of Christ hidden in the Old Testament through shadows and types and symbols that we see from beginning to end. It's a type of our salvation. She tied the scarlet cord in the window. We look back in Exodus chapter 12 and remember that the blood had to be put on the doorpost in order to be saved from the plague that passed through Egypt. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over Exodus chapter 12. The symbolism of the blood of Christ causing God to pass over our sins and deliver us today is obvious. Uh, we see it clearly indicated in Romans chapter 3. Paul says, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. 
This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. It's hard to miss the symbolism, the typology that we see with the blood on the lintel, the scarlet cord that was the symbol of her deliverance. I think it's a picture of that scarlet thread that goes throughout scripture, uh, seen hanging from the harlot's window. And by the way, she didn't stay a harlot. She didn't stay a liar. She came to be with God's people and lived faithfully. God led her to repentance and to salvation. But the symbolism of that scarlet thread goes from one end of the Bible to the other. And I don't think we can, it ties it all together and shows God's plan from the before the foundation of the world. We see it clearly when we're told we are baptized into the death of Christ. Don't you know? Obvious symbolism here of the same order. Jesus says, he who is believed and is baptized will be saved. If we confess our sins, he's faithful to cleanse us when we are in contact with the blood. We think sometimes we've sinned too grievously. Well, we look at Rahab. She was cleansed even though she was a professional harlot. She left that, left that uh, home and came to be with the people of God and uh, was honored in the hall of fame, of faith, and uh, in the lineage of Christ. The spirit and the bride say come. Meet the conditions just as Rahab was invited to come to Israel. You can be in the household of God and know the cleansing power of that blood foreshadowed throughout the Old Testament. We'd encourage you to come worship with us. The Little Rock Church of Christ will be meeting this morning at 10. Thank you for being with us this morning.